This, my friend, is a very, very serious problem. Because as it turns out, Christians are under the apprehension that if they go online, you can read the Sia Septuagint online, which is a Greek translation, we are told, of the Jewish scriptures. Or if you go to a bookstore and buy a Septuagint, which you can, that is the same Greek translation that was rendered some 2,200 years ago. There was t roughly 2,200 years ago a translation of the Torah, that means the five books of Moses alone, that was, um, that was done by 70 or 72 learned men. And we have a lot, a lot of sources for this. The sources are all over the place. The letter Aristide, Joseph, it's just everywhere. This is a, a historical event. And it's never been done before. Um, with that translation into Greek about 2,250 years ago, which means it was during the Greek Empire. And this was for a library in Alexandria. This is a library. So if you have a good library, you want to make sure you have every book. Like people want my books, so libraries buy my books. They want to, they want my books to be in their library. They want, so this was not just a book. This was the Torah. So, seventy or seventy-two uh, learned men went, and they translated the five books of Moses into the Greek language, and that was put in the library in North Africa. Okay. Now, as it turns out. The Greek language was, immer was then the lingo de franca, which means it was kind of like English. English today, the English language today, really, really, I mean, you can travel all over the world and any person who has any education at all could speak some English, but it was kind of like that. Greek was the world language. It wasn't, no language in history was as dominant as the English language is today, but it was something along that line, okay? Now, what happens? As time went on, people wanted the rest of the Jewish scriptures translated into the Greek language. And there were all sorts of people, just like today. You know how many translations there are of the Bible into Malay? There's not one. There are quite a few. I've seen them. <laughs> English, there are hundreds and hundreds of translations of the Jewish Bible into the English language. Each one's different, done by different people. In the exact same way, the Jewish Bible was translated over and over again into Greek. But here is the danger, very big danger. Listen very carefully. Whereas today... When the Bible is translated into English, so whoever does the translation gives it a unique name, a King James Version, a New International Version, a New American Standard, a Revised Standard Version, a New Revised Standard Version. You know where this is going. But imagine, think about this a moment. The King James Version is not the oldest translation of the Bible into the English language, but it's the most well-known and widely read. Imagine for a moment if every person who went and translated the Bible, every publisher, called his Bible the King James Version. Could you imagine that? Well, there would be good reason to do that because it's the most famous and you want to to let's say, to steal the name. You want to have the best-known name. By the way, there were Americans, because there were Americans in the 18th and 19th century, especially in the 19th century, who actually did that, who made a different translation than the translation that was done by the, by the Church of England, and they called it the Authorized Version. I'm not kidding, which is a, is a name for the King James. That's what happened with the Septuagint. 
So when you have a Septuagint in your hands, it is not the Septuagint that someone had in the 2,000 years ago, and it's surely not the original Septuagint, because that Septuagint is only the five books of Moses, and that was lost. The lie was burnt down to the ground. Okay, now we're going to get really controversial, and you have to fasten your seatbelts for this. As it, if you, and if you're going to be offended by what I'm about to say, you don't want to watch. This is the time to just shut this off. If you want to understand the truth of what happened, then listen very carefully. As it turned out, the writers of the Christian Bible altered the Jewish scriptures in order to make the Hebrew Bible appear Christological. This happens everywhere. And as it turns out, there, you, how do you resolve that? The Christian Bible is saying that it says this in the Jewish Bible, and it doesn't say that at all. What happened is those Christologies would then, these Christological translations would then put into a Greek translation. And then that Greek translation was called the Septuagint. Even though it wasn't the Septuagint that was, uh, that was translated 2,200 years ago, meaning two centuries before Christianity, but they kept calling it a Septuagint, and subsequent translations were called Septuagints. And what then happened was the church fathers went and formed, just produced a Septuagint. The final editor was really a man named Origen, who was really quite a bright fellow. He was a third century church father. He was, there was only two church fathers, two, that were completely fluent in both Hebrew and Greek, only two. One was Origen, and the other was Jerome. No one else. I mean, these, these two were completely uh, fluent in Hebrew. And what Origen did was he produced a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. He didn't make it up from scratch. He took what was there that what other Christians had done, and he rendered and actually produced a hexapla, a six, uh, a six column translation in multiple languages with the Hebrew as well. So what happened is today, if you ask in a university, a Christian university or in church, why does it say in the why does it say in a Christian Bible something that's just not in the Hebrew Bible? So I'll say because the writers of the Christian Bible were using the Septuagint, were using a Greek translation. This is I'm sorry to use these terms, but you need to hear it strong. This is a complete and utter nonsense. The Septuagint is never mentioned in the Christian Bible. Never, and they didn't use it, and it doesn't even make sense. Christians believe that the writers of the New Testament were inspired by the Holy Spirit. They don't believe that whoever wrote the book of Matthew just wrote it from his head. They, don't, they believe that Matthew was inspired by the Holy Spirit, told him what to write. So you think that the Holy Spirit forgot how to read Hebrew, that he had to consult a translation? That's that's silly, but this is used as a way to escape, to dodge the staggering problems of complete mistranslations of what it says in the Jewish scriptures, for example. I know you want examples of this. An example is, is Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. What we are told in Matthew's infancy narrative, there are only two of them in the New Testament, that that Jesus was born to a virgin to fill what is said uh, by the prophet Isaiah. And it says in the Matthew 123, uh, Behold, a virgin um, shall conceive and bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, well, I can't, which means God is with us. I can't even begin to tell you how many mistranslated words there are in that thing, in that passage. It's all mistranslated, except for the word she. <laughs> no, that's even mistranslated. The actual Hebrew says, Behold, the young woman is with a child, and she will call the Emmanuel. Even the pronoun she is mistranslated. The Hebrew says, the Karah, she will call. It doesn't say they will call, as it says in Matthew. The whole thing, what am I going to tell you? There's 
There's no definite article Matthew. There is one. And there's no virgin in Isaiah. That's the most important thing. I mean, the whole point is that Matthew is conveying that there's a fulfillment citation that Matthew, that Isaiah prophesied, foretold, predicted that one day a virgin would be born. A virgin would give birth to a child, and this would be an enormous sign. Well, it doesn't say virgin. The way to say virgin in Hebrew is betula. There's no other way to do that. Okay, That's the only word, whether it's biblical Hebrew, modern Hebrew, betula conveys certain virginity. That's it. An alma means a young woman. Now, a young woman might be a virgin. A young woman might have three children. I don't know. Young women get married, and incidentally, it's young women that have children, not old women. So a young woman, it could be, could be, has nothing to do with virginity. So if you'll ask your pastor, why did Matthew mistranslate what it says in Isaiah? I'll say, no, Matthew was relying on the Septuagint. Well, and the Septuagint predates Christianity. Well, this is all nonsense. The this. I'll show you why in other ways. There's the writers in the Testament weren't using a Septuagint. No one has a Septuagint that existed 2,000 years ago. What they were doing is they were mistranslating the text, and then a tr Greek translations were then produced to bolster the mistranslations found in the Christian Bible. The, the, the examples of this are so extensive. I'll give you one other example, which is really a shocker. I don't, I don't know if I, I, I don't teach this often. This will knock your socks off. Okay. If we go to Luke chapter 4, verse 16, 17, 18, 19, it's good to look it up. So we're told that in Nazareth, Jesus went into a synagogue on the Sabbath day. Take a moment. Open up to... Um, Open up to Luke 4, 16, 17, 18. You, get, you need to see this for yourself because I think if you just listen to me, you won't even follow what I'm saying and you, you won't even believe what I'm about to tell you. So just go to Luke, go to Luke chapter 4 and, and just scroll down. So what, what happens? So he goes into a synagogue on the Sabbath and he went up to read. And what did he read? He read from the book of Isaiah. Now, why would someone read from the book of Isaiah in a synagogue? So this is really important. In a synagogue, we read from a Torah, and then after reading from the Torah, which means the five books of Moses, we read a portion of the prophets. We read a section of the prophets. It's an ancient custom to do that. And this, we are told, is a quote from Isaiah chapter 61. Well, watch what happens. It says, so he quotes in verse 8, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he appointed me to preach the gospel, which means the good news. Okay, so the word gospel, good spiel, that means good news. Doesn't mean Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The gospel to the poor, to set me to proclaim the release to captives and to recover the sight of the blind. Now this is and to set free those who are downtrodden. Now, this is should would knock you off your chair. You have to listen very carefully. This will blow your head off. Listen carefully. The idea that a Messiah is supposed to be going around doing miracles and healings, which we see in the New Testament, is nowhere found in the Jewish Bible. This does not mean that the Messiah who's going to come will not heal anybody. I don't know. But you can be sure of this, no prophet was interested in this. And this is a big problem. Why? Because in the Christian Bible, Jesus characterizes someone who's constantly healing people. Healing a paralytic in early Mark, getting, taking uh, demons, exercising demons out of people who are possessed. You know this. This is everywhere. Healing uh, people who are, who are blind and all this stuff is all over. Well, I have news for you. This is not what the Messiah is supposed to do, and it's nowhere mentioned in the Jewish scriptures that the Messiah is supposed to go around healing people. Nowhere. What we are told about the Messiah is he will speak peace to the nations, 
the nations will listen to his rebuke and repent and will go to Zion and will turn to the God of Israel. That's it. We're not told anything else except by his, he will teach. He'll be a teacher and the world will change. It will be worldwide peace. See Zechariah chapter 9 verse 10, which Christians very rarely read. They read 9 and that's it. Read verse 10. Read the first four passages of Isaiah. This was a big problem for the church. Why? Because what you find in the Christian Bible is Jesus, his whole ministry is going around healing people and preaching, but healing people. That's huge. Luke, the author of Luke, wanted to have a passage in the Jewish Bible that spoke of the Messiah healing people. And this phrase in Luke 4.18, where it says, to give sight to the blind does not exist in Isaiah. It isn't there. It is not there. If you now have a Christian Bible here with Luke 4.18, and then you open up the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, you'll see in 61 the quote, and you will accept from one part, and that is to give sight to the blind, to heal the blind. Luke put that in there so that the, pro the Messianic prophecy, um, the Messianic prophecy will look like that the Messiah is supposed to be a healer. Now, I guarantee you this, listen carefully. If you go to your pastor and go, what is going on here? Where did that, where did that clause come from? Your pastor is going to tell you that <laughs> your pastor is going to tell you this comes from the Septuagint. I'm not joking. And if you go to the Septuagint, it's there. So this is like a, 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 a life vest to rescue Luke because this Greek has it in there. And here's the rub. This is a wild rub. In Luke 4.18, we are told that Jesus went into a synagogue in Nazareth and he read from the scroll, which means he wasn't reading from Greek. He was reading from a Hebrew scroll. So he surely never could have read that. He wasn't reading from a Septuagint. Could you imagine the claim that if, if, Christian, if a Christian is a Trinitarian, could you imagine this? Is, that means you have to believe that God used the translation because he, well, he didn't know Hebrew well enough. So that is a very extreme example. There are not two examples of this. There are more than 200 examples of this. The whole Christian Bible is filled with mistranslations. And what is used to answer that problem away? The Septuagint. Even though the, the term Septuagint, is, there's no mention of it anywhere in the Christian Bible. They weren't using a Septuagint. They simply were not rendering the text properly. I mean, look, my friends, you know about Jewish people, and sometimes the things that people think about Jews is not the most pleasant thing. We're not crazy. We're not. It's just we're reading the text in the original Hebrew. And if you're not reading the original Hebrew, it is like theologically living in North Korea, where all the information is completely controlled, and you have no access to independent information. You can't. It's not that you can't think for yourself. You don't have the information to think. It's not like you, just people don't think. It's like if you don't read Hebrew, you have... You're a slave to the translator. Translations are commentaries. That's all they are. They're a human iteration that tells you what the translator thinks the text should, you should think that the text says. And they're, it's, and they're really written to look pretty, but in the sept, so here's the deal. I could also show this to you. Moreover, especially if you're a Protestant, so as it turns out, the Septuagint that you buy in the store also has all the Apocrypha in it. Well, you don't believe in the Apocrypha as the Word of God, so why would the Septuagint have the Apocrypha in it? So what kind of craziness is that? Do you understand? The Apocrypha is not the Word of God, except the Catholics believe it, and it's a late, very late idea that they should believe that's the Word of God. I mean, it's not really late. The, the Catholic Church did venerate certain... Uh, non-biblical texts, but non-Catholics don't believe in these texts. So are you saying that 
they translated the Apocrypha as well? That's crazy. It's, it gets even worse than that. There are apocryphal works whose original language is Greek. For instance, there's an apocryphal work you probably don't study. It's called the Wisdom of Solomon. Okay? It's not part of the Bible. It's part of what Catholics believe is about. Well, the Wisdom of Solomon was written in Greek. So what will they translate Greek into Greek? It's, that means it's, this is, it, it, I'm sorry to say, but this is very silly. And if a person stops and thinks about it, it's silly. How could a translation be superior to the original? In no universe could that possibly be. So, my friends, what's happened is that the, the, from the first time the translation was rendered, that was only the five books of Moses, which means it doesn't include Isaiah, doesn't include Psalms, doesn't include any of those books. And then what happened subsequently, there were many, many translations, and one was keep refining the other until we essentially get to origin. Incidentally, if you have a King James Bible, there is a preface in the King James Bible that the 47 translators uh, introduced their translation. And they say this. This is not the opinion of an Orthodox rabbi in Jerusalem. The, the translators of the, of the King James Version back in 1611 wrote an introduction, an extensive introduction to their work. And part of it was they did not rely on the Septuagint, unless they had to, but they don't say that. They wanted to go use only the Hebrew, and they didn't like the Septuagint. And if you read, they'll tell you the reason we don't like the Septuagint is for the reasons I told you. In fact, in their own words, essentially, they say, paraphrasing, is that if the Septuagint was so perfect, why did they have to keep correcting and revising and revising and revising it? So what I'm telling you is scholars know this, and lay people have never taught this. The Septuagint is a nightmare, and it's used to cover up deliberate mistranslations of the Holy Scripture. My friends, if you don't go back to the Hebrew, you're in tremendous trouble. And all I want for you is that you should read the Hebrew. I'm going to tell you straight away. Every Jewish, religious Jewish child reads the Torah in the original language. None of us use translations. We don't. Because why would you want to have a translation? It's like kissing God through a towel. Who wants that? You want to read the original. Don't trust the translations. And we teach five, six... My first language is Hebrew. So we were always learning out of the original Hebrew. No one was using translations. Translation is treason. And anyway, so that's the backstory of the Septuagint.